Hello and uh, welcome to another tutorial sort of thing, well, tutorial and performance. So I don't know which order I, I'm eventually going to put this on the edit, but either you've just had a performance and this is like a from scratch, or I've just done a little teaser of the performance and we're going in whichever way it is, welcome. And so this uh, tutorial is, is not just Analog 4, which I've done quite a few of, it's how to really um, get a performance system going with the Analog 4, the ARP 2600, 2600, in this case the Behringer one, and also two traditional hardware sequences, very simple ones, the um, SQ ones up here, and how to work them all together. The main thrust is going to be how the, uh, how the uh, Analog 4 Mark II interfaces with the uh, Behringer. So without further ado, let's just sort of go into uh, the rudimentary connections between these two. Um, the reason I like using the Analog 4 in these sort of semi-modular situations is because it's got four CV outs, and, and CV meaning um, control voltage, and that can be anything from actual notes, gates, um, linear signals, so you can have LFOs coming from here as well, and um, clocks, which is um, why there's only three here, because I've got uh, ABC already pre-wired to allow me to connect to the um, Behringer, and then D is actually coming out as a clock, because that's going to clock and keep these two guys in sync, so that lead coming over there, and then there's a, um, a multi-ed sync over to this one. So those are linked to the clock on CV track D on this one, or CV out D rather than a track. Um, it's pretty straightforward how it works, uh, just to give you a quick demo. So this is CVA coming out of the analog 4 around the back here, and let's connect it for example to oscillator 2 on here and then we can play track one. In fact, you assign CVA, so if you can see that, let's just get this cable out of the way, CVA is assigned to track one. Um, so in other words, whatever I play on track one of the analog four will be sent note-wise to there. So let's just put um, some basic uh, notes in here. What you're actually hearing now is the um, analog 4 sound. If we listen to this, we probably won't hear anything yet because they're like anything in the modular world, particularly analog synths like this, it needs a gate. So I'm gonna what was that? I'm gonna take a gate from from here which is ticking over. So I need a cable. I'm gonna take a gate out of track one. Uh, so these um, SQ1s I, I usually use in two-channel mode, so it's like an eight-step sequencer, but when you reverse it, it becomes a 16 or something, uh, or 14, um, and there's a, an, another track there. But I'm going to take the gate from CV1 and put it into, carefully coiling it around things so it keeps this clear, the um, ADSR which is the envelope out, which is connected to the VCA over here. So when we play now, so we're actually hearing these notes um, gated at the frequency of this. And remember, as I said, if I go to CV D and slow the clock down, You get some lovely cross gating possibilities, and like likewise, I can um, well not likewise, but just to show you it working. Uh, this is a I think a fourteen semiquaver step, so seven eight. Um, so you can hear it playing both. I'll turn off the analog four, so we're not confused. All we're listening to at the moment are the oscillators on here. Likewise, I can just step between the oscillators. So go to oscillator three, turn it up. 
take it out, put it into oscillator one, which is, as you can hear, a lot lower. I've actually got the oscillators tuned an octave apart at the moment, which gives me a bit of flexibility on the um, the way these are mixed. So I can use one as a sort of sub bass and low bass, one as a middle sequencer type thing or something rhythmic, and then the top one as sort of sequencer lead line. So I'll put it back into put it back into oscillator three and. Uh, if we look at track one again, I can play in live, of course. Got a bit of, um, oh yeah, so the, let's go over the audio route here, let's turn that down a second. So these two outputs of the Behringer, um, it says left and right because there, there is the possibility of doing things in stereo, which I'll do in a second, or having stereo things but normally it's in mono that's left that's right uh, if we put it in the min middle the middle and uh, the middle it's now mono it's been fed into the and this is where the analog 4 comes in handy as well because it uh, has two external ins or left and right in this case and I've got them pan left and right and you can actually hear I've got some delay already on a bit of reverb and a bit of chorus so that's the um, that's the Behringer completely dry And then a little bit of delay on. Of course you can double up on the oscillators by going through a mult. So I can take, this, for example, the, um, the analog 4 out and then using a couple of short cables um, ask it to multiply them, let's say both to oscillator 2 and oscillator 3. Uh, just playing with the filter there on the... So you're still listening to just just the um, Behringer, of course. So two oscillators acting in unison there. And we can see it's in time with the, um, the Analog 4, perhaps going to um, track 4 in here, which I'm using a, a, an 8-step loop, allowing me to put in um, some rhythm, rhythm type things. So I'll just put a kick in there which I'll, I'll keep going as we're connecting things together so it helps you understand what's going on. So yeah, that's two oscillators. And allow me to mix between them. Uh, the advantage of this setup, by the way, because, uh, you know, the Analog 4 is very menu divey. Um, well, it's at least one or two levels deep, uh, so it's not super great for performance but of course the Behringer I could be changing the filter and bringing in bringing in another oscillator um, so there's you know even just even just with that thing I just did there there's um, there's like four things going I'm changing the resonance the filter simultaneously I'm changing the balance of two oscillators which um, sure you can set LFOs to do that on the um, analog four, but it becomes um, rather uh, computerized and it's not really flowy as a performance. Anyway, let's get back to the patching all this together type thing. So the advantage of using the SQ1s as well as, um, I'm gonna put that one into there, I think. Uh, the SQ1s as well as the sequencer from here, because the electron sequencer is nice, but as you've probably seen from previous videos, which I, um, if I remember this edit, I'll link somewhere up here. Where is it? On the right, usually. Um, using the SQ1s allows a thing called active step. So let's, for example, uh, forget the Analog 4 CV note for a moment. Let's patch in the, um, the SQ1 CV out, and we'll go into... Um, let's go into oscillator 2 again. So that's actually being played from this top track and you can see I can just twiddle the notes on here which is pre-quantized meaning it's in tune and it's not, I, I tune it to, to G minor because it's got an A natural in 
so it, 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 people think it's C minor, but because of the A natural, you can actually tune it to G minor. And it really comes into its own with the with the clock controller here. So if I take it into thirds, you get that lovely, and that's um, true polyrhythm, is it? Uh, no, sorry, it's, it's polymeter. But you can hear it's, it's it's putting those threes over the over the the twos, and you can see I've just added in an extra note here, and you you, you can see you get this lovely contrary motion going between the SQ ones and let's say track one here, which I'll I'll um, change the sound of that it's a bit. Um, bit of um, delay on it. Just checking my audio levels. I've actually got my voice going into the GoPro, which is this camera, and the, um, the, the main mix coming from this compressed output going into the zoom here. Uh, so what are we doing? We're listening to... So we're listening to the SQ-1 playing Oscillator 2 here. A sort of three note sequence. Um, if I put some delay on that, because it's sort of in triplets, you won't hear the um, effect of the analog four delay, because this is dotted eights, which has the effect of doubling up on those. As soon as I change the clock back to sort of quavers, we start to hear it come into sync again. track one so you can hear it. Sounds like I need to do a little bit of tuning but I'll do that on the fly. Uh, one way to tune of course is just to like on track one um, have a constant note. I could use a chromatic tuner of course. So that's now a G, a lower G, I think. And then I'm making sure that, in this case, oscillator two's in tune. And then likewise, and it's a bit boring doing tuning, but you can see it. You go through my pain. I mean, once these things are in tune, they're pretty static. It's not like the Model D and some of the other simps that need time to warm up. Once you get them locked in, and then oscillator one, which sounds okay. So I hope you're following so far. It was mainly about the the clock. Um, controlling the SQ-1 and providing that ability to immediately go into and it makes sense with a bit of, perhaps put some hi-hats in on track 4 get a bit more of a groove and let's pan the hi-hats each hit and ok, a little bit boring on that one so let's um, Let's add a few more notes. And you can see all the time, I don't know which camera you can see, but I'm, oh yeah, it must be this one. Um, ability to just change notes on the fly here while doing other things. Sorry, I'll get, oh, I'll just <laughs> remembered that um, track, track one is in, um, what's the word? Tuning mode, let's put a, another sequence in. And remember, um, we've already got, so uh, during a performance, we've already got CVA having track one rooted to it. So for example, if I wanted to 
emphasize track one, I could just patch it in immediately, say to, um, in this case, oscillator three. And it's playing along. Obviously gated, and that, that's one of the drawbacks of the ARC 2600, is the ADSR is sort of linked to one trigger or gate. You can, you can have gates within gates, but there's going to be like a master attack point, and then you can have multiple ones within that, but you're always going to be limited to um, this like master trigger, which in this case is coming from here. And this, this brings in, before we go into more in the Behringer, brings into this second one, and because it's, turn track one off, so we're just listening to the Behringer now, coming from here on a triplet gate, so let's make it a quaver gate. So the limit of this, I could go, I don't know if you can see this, is two, two clock, and then there's a, um, this one is three clock, and then there's four clock, there's also a one clock, and you hear it went off there, and that's because it's, um, for some reason, the clock from here, and I've fiddled with some of the settings, is not quite sending the right um, type of trigger to the SQ1, so I have to increase this gate thing here, which is, is fine. But one thing I like to do is use the second SQ1, to take the gate off, and use that as the gate, so it becomes, uh, or you have the ability to run a um, multiple or cross ribbons based on these two. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that, uh, because this is a constant, uh, constant sequence at the moment. There's no gaps. I can introduce gaps. So, for example, I'm going to make the active step on this top row. We're only what, uh, gating the top row here. I'm going to make it five steps, which only affect these five notes. I'll just turn them off for reference. But of course, I can leave gaps in the gates. And because this is on a say, uh, well, this is on a loop of five steps, and this is on a loop of four notes, you get this sort of, you're starting to get these endless patterns. What we gate earlier, so we're coming from here at the moment. If I bring, if I bring the um, SQ1 back in, controlling this. So this is just the two SQ1s. This one's providing gate on this weird sort of five loop, using active step to turn and um, the gate on and off control. And this is playing four step or four notes in a loop. And this is running twice as fast. So you end up that lovely little um, sequence there. Let's bring the bit of a beat back in. So you get lovely complexity just using the two SQ1s in this. Of course, I can still at any point bring in track one CVA, CV into say another. And then you can gradually build up the part and build up the piece. I'm bringing the analog four sound back in on track one. If I um, get rid of the SQ1 activity, you can actually hear turn the, just turn the reverb down a touch on the. Arc, the Behringer arc. So, what are we listening to at the moment? Yeah, we're listening to the um, track one of here, which is fed to oscillator two, but it's being gated by this sort of double time five step loop. Of course, independently of what the um, analog four is doing, in this case it's playing a straight, this straight beat, just for reference. I can adjust the um, the clock of this. And you can hear, because um, I've got the uh, envelope set to quite staccato, you can hear occasionally some of the notes in between, which is, um, uh, sorry, track one. If I turn up the 
you can actually hear track one playing if I override the ADSR. But this, tend, this setup tends to work on, on apes, whereas when we're doing um, three time or th meters of three, this one works better. So I often switch over the master gate. So I'll take this is the master gate wire going into the, well, in this case, the uh, AR the attack release envelope generator, which triggers both these two. Um, so I can actually take that one, it'll sort of go off temporarily and then feed it into that. Allowing me to do the thirds more successfully. The reason being this is double the time, so I've actually set this SQ one up to be um, uh, twice the pulses per measure. So whatever words it needs, uh, or it, it, it <laughs> It runs at twice the speed based on the input pulse, which is the same on both of these. So you can, well, that's kind of cool to do. Um, so where were we? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a mix of using the SQ1s and the uh, analog four sequences. Uh, the other thing we can do, let's go back to sort of that clock. Um, we won't use the CVs of the analog four now. We'll use actually, um, so if we want some modulation, which is pretty standard in modular gear, of course, what we're listening to at the moment. So I'm going to connect the SQ1 track one here onto, so that's these three notes. So let's say we wanted to modulate the filter here. Uh, one thing we can do, the easiest way, just to grab a lead and use the built-in LFO of the Behringer. Connect it to uh, one of the filter modulation points here, for example. And the speed of the LFO is controlled by this LFO speed here. But well, you can get some lovely um, lovely effects if you obviously boost the depth of the LFO. Um, it comes into its own as well when you have a bit of white noise. And... Da -da -da -da, what am I doing? Oh yeah, just So during performances, for example, you can just have like a beat going and then and slowly bring in the noise from this using an off out of sync LFO. And if you've got say a low note, so I'm just switching to the input for the oscillator one, which is a lower one, you can have a sort of um, filtery, almost um, didgeridoo type thing. Um, just to go on to the analog four, obviously the, the whole point of this is not to just use, just that, that um, play in the background, is not just to use the ARP 2600, but to utilize and, and save tracks on the, uh, on the analog four, because once you've got like three oscillators doing slightly different things, that almost gives you three tracks of activity. You've also got also got a noise track on here, so that's four, if you like, four sounds. There um, is the ability to send parts, or not parts of the oscillator, but different waveforms from each oscillator via this uh, voltage processor into two sides of the stereo, which then gives you two more different things happening. I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a second. But it frees up, in this case, um, three track or well, four tracks of the analog four if you don't have you know if you don't have the drums a dedicated uh, rhythm track and uh, then uh, and you have like a Volker beats or a, 
Digitact or something like that. I could put the Digitact here, but I'm, I'm um, trying to keep things relatively simple. Just checking that's uh, recording. Uh, but it, as I said, it frees up four tracks and you don't need to double them. So, you know, track one here, even though I've got it coming out of CVA, it's hardly an inconvenience to CVA to use one of the other, two other tracks that you can use for notes and, and gates and triggers. But say, for example, the CV, in this case, the CV track, so FX and CV, can be two other note tracks. So I'm going to play something into, into here. You can't hear it at the moment because I, I haven't sent it anywhere. And the, sorry, I'll turn track one off. You won't hear anything at the moment because I've not sent it anywhere. And all I need to do is go to CVA and say, can you now use the CV track instead? And I've just sent that to this oscillator three. And that was the, those were the notes I just placed in here. And you can actually do it live. And I'll take my finger off, of course, and it will then play whatever I sequenced in. Play something else in. Um, take the LFO effect off. So that's coming from the CV track, freeing up, as I've said, the other four tracks. And I can use the FX track as well, out of, say, one of the uh, CVB, um, which I can feed into, like, Oscillator 2. I'm sort of switching them around here at the moment just to demonstrate things. So FX, the FX track has got... I'm just going to hook these around there. I've got something on it at the moment. Let's turn the CV track off. Oh yeah, one of the issues I found with these tracks is because we're gating this separately, rather than taking gate and CVs from tracks, which I could do. I could take gate and CV from there, gate and CV from there, but I wouldn't have any CVs left necessarily for clocks. But then I'm thinking I could go MIDI into here because this accepts MIDI and we could do things all through MIDI. But I, I do like this patching ability when I'm performing. Um, but what was I saying? Yeah, uh, because we're just taking the notes, we've still got the gate active. So the effect of that is on um, this one, for example, it's not receiving any CV um, on... Oh, sorry, not that one. Sorry, yeah, oscillator one's not receiving any CV at the moment, apart from this one, so it's just playing what the gate's giving it. Or oh, this gate, sorry, I was getting confused. This gate's not active at the moment, this one is. Um, anyway, back to, yeah, so the CV and FX tracks. FX track is going through, I just want to check. CVB is set to now FX. Uh, to CVB and CVB is going into this oscillator 2. So that's these three notes. I can turn one off or turn two off and play something in. A bit of um, I feel love. And the octave here, I can change the octave if I don't if it doesn't work for that particular note. I don't really, I mean, sadly, there's no octave switch on here. You have to actually detune these, so you've got to tune them up. Once you get them in tune, you don't really want to be fiddling during a live performance, unless you're doing ambient stuff, which occasionally I do, or experimental. So that's the FX um, <coughs> note channel being sent to CVB, which is connected directly to that oscillator. and getting a little bit of decay on that. I'm just checking, I think that's the reverb sort of uh, lengthening these notes. So the gate is coming from here. I can change the 
the delay of the gate, which is useful sometimes if you're performing. You kind of want this stuttery feel. That kind of sounds like it's going out of time and then you sort of want to bring everything back in. have the drums chipping away in the background so um, like I said I'm using the the two there I do like to double up though uh, so during a performance if for example I wanted to go from the CV track which is now being sent to this one let's say I wanted for this oscillator oscillator 3 to now be track 1 which is playing this Um, all I need to do is to go into the CV and is A into it? Yeah. Go into A and then immediately switch that to track one and I can go back to CV. Just by ch changing the designation. And obviously it's in time of course. I'll make them a, a bit different. Um, And then back to the CV track. The advantage of um, sequencing from the Analog 4 is things like transposition. So imagine we've got this going. And uh, this is playing um, obviously oscillator 3 here. Is I can transpose, so I can suddenly go as well as changing the tracks on the Analog 4, it's changing the CV out to these oscillators. Um, the disadvantage is if you've got a mixed thing going, so if you've got sequences coming from here as well, they're not going to transpose, and you do end up getting into a bit of a mess. So if we take, for example, this one, So we're listening to oscillator 1 here coming from here. So now when I transpose on the analog 4, the SQ1 of course doesn't change. So you've got to be careful when you're doing um, transposing things that you, uh, you haven't really got any, any of these running. If I've got two of these, in fact I've got a, a I feel love thing going here. Let's send it into um, triplet, sort of, um, not triplet, but three step. And then I can transpose track one and these two in, in, that are only coming from here in one go. So let's drop to fifth below, and six below. Seven semitones. Okay, and then we put the clock back into double time. Right. There. Obviously, with, with all of this, I can turn. Um, if I want to um, disable these. As I've said, you can't because the gate's still going into here. Um, so you really have to just mix them down um, using this. So I use this all the time, the, particularly the, the four here, as a mixer um, for the oscillators, unless I'm doubling up on some of them. I'm obviously not doubling up at the moment. Um, the other thing is the, if we go back to the, this sort of um, did we do thing. Um, I'm gate, sorry, CV output C, I'm actually using as a modulation source. 
So I've got that one set, and, and by the way, you set these by choosing the, um, the project button, going into CV config on the global settings, pressing yes, and then you sort of go down CV A, B, C, D, set, telling them what you want them to be. So A and B on this list are set to uh, pitch volt per octave, and track D is of course set to clock, if you can actually read that on this camera. And track C, I've actually got set to a, a linear value. It's just a linear voltage between 0 and 5 volts. And you can change those to between minus 5 plus 5 if you're doing sort of bipolar things, but I've just got it set to that at the moment. What that allows me to do, and it gets a bit complicated, just turn that down because I'm shouting a bit, is um, use the built-in LFO for the CV track, so CV LFO, and like all the other LFOs and, and all the other tracks, it allows you to des have a destination. So in this case, I've set the value for CV, or the destination for the LFO built into this one, to be set to CVC value. So that speed, uh, of the LFO and the depth is going to control plus and minus and plus zero, zero to five volts coming from here, which allows me to instead of having the built in LFO, so I'll just take that lead off, I can connect directly from the analog four into this control, into this uh, control input, like a modulation input. So that's coming from here, and I can keep things in sync then. If I set this to 48 speed, I can show you what I mean by sync. I can actually choose a square wave LFO. Obviously you've got to have the filter set down a bit so you can hear the effect of it. Uh, so that's eight. Uh, um, eight times the 48 pulses here. Um, there's a resonance control as well, I think. Uh, because this is on square wave, it's not the most musical, so I'll go back to sine wave. And then we've got the sync going from the LFO because I still haven't quite worked out how to get this LFO in sync. Um, even though I've sent clocks to this sample and hold system here, um, I haven't got to the point yet where this is linked. There probably is an um, easy way of doing it, but this is, a, this is like a built-in clock. I do use this clock for other things. So there's a, sample, there's a couple of clocks in here. There's all movement, if you like. There's the LFO. And then we've also got the sample and hold speed as well, which I can send a, a clock to. But now we've got um, this, you can hear what's going on there. And I can control the depth from here. So that's um, no depth, and then gradually increase it. So that's linear value being sent through CVC. And I've also got control of the value level there as well. So then we now we've got that sort of full movement. So we go back into the LFO again. Let's go back to a square wave. So cool, so that's, that's a way of getting synced LFOs. Just for the moment, I will turn it off there. Once, you, once you've got the output of it set from here and the right tempo, it's then just a case of bringing it in, bringing it in on the, um, the input level because it's sort of attenuated. Um, right, a couple of other things. So one of the nice things, just leave the drums, drums chunnering away there. A quick drink. Uh, one of the nice things with the Behringer as well as these four 
tracks, like the three oscillators and noise. Is it's got a left and right input on the outputs here. So what one thing I tend to do is take, for example, a duplicate of oscillator one, uh, let's say a saw, put it into this attenuator circuit down here. So it's like an input and then a control output. So at the moment it's on zero and then take the output of that into one of the outputs. Um, so in this case, I'm going to put it onto the left input. And then when I lift this up, it doesn't sound very attractive at the moment, because uh, it's just a pure waveform. But it gives, um, gives me the ability to just bring in some extra color in stereo from, from the Behringer. And if obviously I put some chorus and reverb on the Behringer and then bring in remember the oscillator one here which is the one I just patched is coming from the coming from the SQ1 bring the drums up Again, control over the clock. Let's go into thirds. Bring in okay, I sort of demonstrated that. But as well as uh, what it allows you to do is, is to go from let's turn the drums off completely. For example, it allows us to go from that sort of sustained sound and then gradually bring in the gated the gated sound without affecting this constant one so that's kind of a nice breakdown type thing particularly if you just got um, my hi-hats going let's take the kick out a bit of reverb on those or something. And you can go into threes. All the time I can just adjust the notes, which is one of the, like I said, one of the disadvantages on the, the Analog 4 is that to change the notes on the fly of a sequence, you can do it. I mean, let's, let's do it now, but it doesn't sound as fluid. So here's track one. Track one, there's the notes being played. If I want to change one note, sure. I want to change three notes. Add in filler notes. Um, so yes, you can add notes, but you can hear it's very sort of regimented. Uh, you know, I can take notes out. Uh, but compare it to the sort of fluidity of, of say, doing it. Turn track one off. And one of the other advantages, I don't want to go with comparisons of the sequences because they've both got pros and cons, uh, but I can go from two steps to four steps. And then bring in this extra sound, which is gated. And the other, the other thing I like to do is take um, another um, 
sort of different waveform from one of the oscillators and then double it into the other speaker. Uh, and because I normally have oscillator 3 controlled from here, I'll use the triangle output, put it into another input, a separate uh, attenuator as part of this voltage processor thing. And I'm going to take that one out and put it into the other side of the stereo. And I think that's, uh, we can, I, I stick these little stickers on, I don't know if you can see them, um, just to remind me what's going into what. So CVA, I know, is going into here, and I think um, checking the, um, uh, these, so we've got CVA, sorry, is track one at the moment. So that one. So that means, for example, because this is on the right, and track one on the analog four, if I set that to the left, we should end up with um, one each side, because this one is a sort of fixed right. Um, this one can be a, a pan if I want. I could easily throw on a um, bit of panning on on this one. Are you going to pan for me? Yeah, so that's moving around. And then of course we've got oscillator 3, which is not activated at the moment. And then we've got now three things happening in different parts of the stereo. And full control over the, um, over the notes here, so I can add in a couple of extra notes. So while we got the, that quartet playing, and remember it's only one track from here, feeding two different sounds, because we've got, so this one, sorry, the actual gated part is controlled through the filter. So we could have this very um, LFO controlled. Likewise, we could do some crazy things to the actual analog 4 sound, but I want to keep these simple just for this um, demonstration. Just checking we're still recording. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what else is going to do? It free, like I said, it frees up the analog 4 to do other things. So for example, um, track 2 on here is an uh, initialized sound. And what I want to do with this one is turn it into a pad and then I'll have a little later in the performance so I'm going to use it as a um, rhythmic sort of stabby thing, a bit sort of groovy. So let's just put infinite sustain on. Bit of um, reverb and delay. Bring in the second oscillator. Bit of detune. Turn it down a bit because it's annoying. Uh, control the filter, low pass filter. Uh, let's just select the envelope for the filter, infinite sustain as well. Um, the root of this is in G minor, like I mentioned earlier, because of the, uh, particularly the SQ ones, which are a bit fixed. So um, that's going to be my, my root for this one. I'm going to make this into a fifth chord and I've got a whole bunch of videos explaining how to do that so I'm just going to oscillate to two I'm going to tune up uh, seven steps seven semitones and then add the fifth so we've now got that's a traditional chord it needs a bit of um, colouring so I'm going to put a bit of an LFO on the filter for this one a bit slow and a bit of panning Just the filter. Probably a bit much on the filter there. A 
Um, do, sorry, doing a bit of sound designing here, which I, I didn't, want, didn't want to do necessarily. So now I've got the um, the root and the fifth, which I can obviously add a bit of harmonic content around things. As long as I don't press certain notes, because I don't want to press a um, what do I want to press? I don't want to press a B flat. I don't think they're all okay. Oh, but I don't want to press an A because that will introduce an E natural, which I don't want. So there's a B flat, E flat. Don't quite like the sound. To make it a bit smoother. Oh, I'm gonna let some. Um, Choose sawtooths instead. A bit of pulse width modulation. Um, so that's cool. That'd be a nice sort of pad to add in the background, and then we can obviously bring in and see what's happening with some of these. Oh, we've still got. I've got the old um, My Feel Love going. Let's change it to something else. Um, something a bit syncopated, I think. Oh, back into Feel Love again. Not doing much luck there. That'll do. And as you, as you know with the Analog 4, uh, I select a track here. I'm constantly selecting tracks over this side to be able to change things. Bring in the kicks. Bring in the uh, track one with its corresponding oscillators. I can turn up. Now uh, we haven't got anything on track three yet. I don't think. So this is where. Um, Bit of a lead my coin handy. performance territory. If I want to do a breakdown, you can see this having this um, sustained note on uh, over here is kind of useful. Then I can adjust the um, adjust the drums to just bring the hi-hats back in.
Right. As you can say, I always get into <coughs> doing performancey things. Um, oh yeah, the other thing with um, track two here, which is playing this pad note, um, I can turn into something rhythmic pretty easily by just taking the infinite off, making it a bit more uh, shorter envelope. And let's just check how long it is. One bar, that'll do. So a bit of stabbing. Just check the envelope. Let's make that a bit stabby too. And that'll be nice if we can get rid of that. Get rid of the drums. Then we can sort of introduce, for example, the clock in triplets or thirds. So bring in one of the sequences, see how that sounds. So this uh, is coming from CVB, check CVB, coming from the FX track. Not, you sort of remember this after a while, of course. So it's got these three notes, just make it a bit more interesting. And then we've got this guy as well on the SQ1. Um, secretly on track four, I can lift, using these sound locks, lift up the volume for the bass drum and then immediately go into the beat again. Uh, bring in the theme, or teaser of the theme, or actually play it in manually. Right, so now you've seen this uh, kind of patched together, um, this will be the end of the video in which I say things like <coughs> um, ask any questions, any comments, um, or it's the start of the video in which case, uh, sorry it's the end of the first section in which case I say enjoy the performance. I'll have a, a short, I'll just turn everything off, make sure everything's worked, and then go into a um, longish performance using all of the techniques I've showed you. Constantly pulling in and out of, say for example, the the CVs from the Analog 4, um, taking extra leads for CVs and gates from the SQ1s, and, um, and obviously fiddling with all the sounds on the Analog 4, which is pretty straightforward for me, because I kind of know what I'm doing on this, I think. All right, so thank you very much if this is the end, and um, yeah, ask questions and subscribe and like and all that sort of stuff. All right, see you for the moment.